As much as I'd like to be, I am not a speedrunner. I don't have the consistent time to dedicate, I don't have the technical skills to be competitive, but most of all, I'm not a fan of the competition. It's why in the speedrun videos that I have done, there's always a catch. Whether it's being the first to do something, like Grunt ABL, or adding some sort of twist, like, uh, whatever's going on here. Regardless, what I am a fan of is the challenge, the glitches, and of course, the accomplishment. That's why, about four months ago, I announced that I was beginning my quest to beat LEGO Star Wars The Complete Saga blindfolded. I knew this wouldn't be easy, I was going to have to put in way more time than even my ABL run, which, for the record, has almost double the levels of TCS as a whole. Finding setups, bottlenecks, and developing strategies based off of in-game mechanics that I had no idea even existed. And this video is the story behind all of it. Oh! Let's go! <laughs> How long was that one? Uh, 50 minutes? Hey, that's not bad. It's on the shorter side. Oh, Let's go back to the right. There's more? He's done it! Pod race is over. Okay. How do we have a problem? Am I that lost? Oh no. Dude. I'm gonna lose it. When I got back from vacation in early January, I began to draw up a route for the run, taking lots of different angles into account, but mainly prioritizing one thing, the extras. These extras, or red bricks, can give the characters a wide variety of buffs, and there were four that I was really interested in grabbing throughout the challenge. Those being invincibility, exploding blaster bolts, vehicle smart bomb, and infinite torpedoes, in that order. Though, actually acquiring the extras was going to be almost paradoxical, as the route to get infinite torpedoes in 6-6 was made way easier by already having exploding blaster bolts, but getting exploding blaster bolts was made way faster by already having infinite torpedoes. You can see why there's an issue there. Putting those aside for the moment, we still have invincibility and vehicle smart bomb. Invincibility makes you, well, invincible, which is probably the single most important thing for the run, and Vehicle Smart Bomb allows you to press the B button to destroy nearby enemy ships. Luckily for us, the only one of these red bricks that would make us have to go back into a level in free play was Invincibility, and it's not even 20 seconds into the level, and the other three are very easily accessible in story mode. So, while it was easy to list Invincibility as the first red brick to grab, and just throw Vehicle Smart Bomb somewhere in the middle, as it isn't really useful until the very end of the run, I had to make a choice. Would I rather do Episode 6 without exploding bolts, or do Episode 2 without infinite torpedoes? Eventually, I decided that it would be very time-consuming, but in the end easier, to do all of Episode 2 first. This would leave Infinite Torpedoes, which is arguably the second most important extra for the entire run, for last. Because of this, I knew I wouldn't be able to play through each episode in full. I would be leaving and coming back periodically based on the extras that I had available. And so, the final route went as follows. I would begin as everybody does in 1-1, and once the other episodes open up, I would immediately head to episode 4, beating every single level except for the final one. I would come back to this once I had infinite torpedoes. Once I beat Escape from the Death Star, I would enter back into free play, grab invincibility, and then head to 3-1 to grind some studs. While there, I would use my numerous attempts of said level to grab Vehicle Smart Bomb, purchasing both at the shop when I get the right amount of money. Afterwards, we would beat all of Episode 2, grabbing Exploding Bolts in 2-5 and purchasing it after we beat Dooku. We then go back to clean up the rest of Episode 1, following it with the rest of Episode 3, then complete all of 6, getting infinite torpedoes in the process, allowing us to finally conquer into the Death Star, and all of Episode 5, finishing off the run. 
After I had figured out that uh, very, very difficult route, I created a practice guide that would help keep track of miscellaneous details, like which direction to move in whatever room, if I needed to do anything special, like pull a lever or press a button to progress, or even very consistent setups for some of the game's tricks. This was first done in my notes app, which was very disorganized, but it's now been made into a Google spreadsheet. The link will be below. That is a lot to take in, but before I showcase the run, I'll give a very important disclaimer. It's natural to be skeptical of things like this, especially ones that seem pretty improbable. I opted to use a double-knit winter hat as my mask, as the blindfold that I was planning to use ended up being see-through. The reason I didn't cover my face with a hood or 30 different blankets was because I make content. I wanted to be able to breathe, speak, and otherwise interact with my chat and the people watching live. So to quell hopefully most of your questions, I'll leave some links down below of me playing through various different levels with the screen turned off, a hat and hood covering my face, and me turned away from the monitors to show that this challenge is indeed possible. But anyways, let's finally see the three month journey that it took to beat LEGO Star Wars The Complete Saga Blindfolded. And funny story, I forgot to hit the recording button until the second level of the run, so I'm just gonna re-record this first level the best that I can. Oops. As we hit new game, we spawn directly inside of negotiations, which was the third easiest level in the run. All it takes is a couple directional changes, going from forward to right to back to forward again, and some character swaps over to TC14. But we do get to see the first cool bit of strategy in the run, what I'll call panel radius location. The sound for droid panels in the game activate when you walk within a certain distance of the panel, or away as well. We can sort of view these like mini checkpoints, and use the radius of the sound to guide ourselves to their locations. When we hear a panel we have to activate, then we know for sure where we are on the level. After that, it's just a matter of finding some buttons and using some more PRL to exit level 1, using the door sound in the cantina to count to 4, hitting the record button for once, and entering into secret plans. So we have PRL for droids, but not every level is going to have a droid character. We need a more universal way of moving around and knowing where we are. Sure, we can listen to how loud the building sounds are in the first room, and then walk headfirst into a wall for two minutes, or we can be smart. Like a bat in a subterranean cave, it's time to use echolocation. Blaster bolts make a sound when they leave your gun and hit a wall or an object and we can use these two sounds to gauge the distance between our player and a given wall, allowing us to not only find our way around rooms by hugging the walls, but also by using it to center ourselves in various hallways and rooms going forward. As you can see, I wasn't uh, too comfortable with this trick quite yet, but rest assured we'll get there. Though, once we pull the lever in the next hallway, we encounter what ends up being the biggest issue in the entire game. One that's found in every level, and even the cantina. The game's shitty camera. Holding forward does not always bring you forward, as once a camera angle changes, so does your character's direction. The issue, we don't know when these camera changes happen. As far as we know, holding forward could have us end up going backwards. But hey, come on, I'm sure it won't be that big of a deal. Right? After falling off several different times, we mash B enough to find the build pile on the upper level of this room here, and then fall off again. Twice. Hi, too far right. I don't want to fall off. Well. We use the sound of the doors opening and more echolocation to feel our way around the box puzzle, where we spend legitimately five minutes just wondering where we are, then enter part two of Secret Plans. Where is box? I hear R2 and 3PO. We just gotta find box. No, oh, there's one, okay. So we gotta find the right box now. Are there like a switch I gotta pull to make this actually work? What is this? Oh, that was door open, there's enemies now. Okay, wait, wait, wait. That's cutscene then, right? Yes, halfway done, boys. When this part of the level kicked in, oh boy, let me tell you, I finally had the realization that I was in way over my head. A guy like me had no idea what was going on. I'm gonna get them. This guy's got the fucking Dodgers of the Century going on. He's destroying me. Spare username that please says you'll get him eventually. I know, I'm gonna try. I have to. 
Yeah, come up. I killed C-3PO a couple of times as well as punched the limbs off of his body before moving on to the end of the level. I floundered around for about 10 minutes before hearing the panel noises and sending us crashing into Judland, with nearly an hour spent in level 2 alone. Judland itself was a pretty messy level, but I did learn some cool tricks that I could use to speed things up in future sections. One of those being target jumping. When you reflect a bolt off of your lightsaber, your character turns to face whatever shot it. The same goes for when you shoot a blaster at an enemy, force something, or in general interact with anything in the game. If you then jump slash as a saber character or double jump as a blaster character with your joystick in neutral, you'll automatically head towards the thing that you targeted. This helped with trying to get to the Tusken Raiders in Room 1, and later on when going up the bridge you build in the sand. Well, uh, not really. But like monkeys at a typewriter, we were able to make it to the box section, build the box, and jump around the cliffside, where we encounter the Sand Crawler. When you think of terrifying beasts in Star Wars, you probably imagine those big old dragon guys from the Clone Wars, or that big alligator from the Mandalorian, but in my mind, it's this thing. I, again, I had no idea this section could be so difficult, but here we are. The biggest issue was that the partner player doesn't do anything on their own, and instead the game relies on you to switch to them to do it yourself. And with how many times the puzzle changes from saber to blaster, saber to blaster, it was hard to keep up. The basic principle, though, ended up just being to mash B as both the characters until something happened. And happened, something did. And by that I mean falling off numerous times. It looks like old Ben forgot to take his pills again. Like everything else in my life, though, I was eventually able to fall tens of feet onto hard rock and be sunk like a vacuum. This poor gong droid did not deserve what was coming next, but a man's gotta do what a man's gotta do. Which is spend another 10 minutes pushing boxes, of course. In all seriousness, the boxes were becoming a pretty big issue, especially on the more dynamic tracks, and I was beginning to realize that without echolocation, the levels where I play as only Saber characters, which is pretty much everything in the prequels, was going to be a nightmare. But we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. The only other rough part of the crawler ended up being the part where you free 3PO from his jar. I thought you had to activate the R2 panel when the vacuum was over 3PO, but as it turns out you can just do it whenever, and the next time the vacuum passes over 3PO it just works. So again I sat in this room for about 5 minutes after I had already freed him, wondering why it wasn't working. And that's just the second third of the level. We still have another 30% to go, and it's the worst 30%. PRL won't really work here as the panels are all at different elevations and you aren't able to reach all of them right away. I wish I would have internalized this more before starting the run, because I guess at some point I ended up just walking all the way back to the crawler and falling into the void repeatedly before holding forward and praying which only leads to yet another conveniently placed pit. Eventually though, I was able to get the first pit filled, and after I killed a few of the Tuscans, women and children too, I could hear where the ramp pieces were for 3PO, which allowed me to progress forward to yet another mud pit. Lovely. This one was a bit easier than the last, since all that was required of me was to push this box forward, but it still took an embarrassingly long amount of time. Once we finished the level in the following room, I saw that it had taken me an hour and a half of time. I have to use the bathroom so badly. Dude, that was an hour and a half of Judland. Oh my god. <laughs> the levels seem to only be getting harder and harder. Would this trend continue on to the rest of the run? For the most part, yes. Mos Eisley Spaceport didn't go too awfully with the exception of just one room. We didn't have EBB at this point, so I had to build the walker myself to blow up the gate in the second room. After some PRL, getting stunlocked by a walker, and some very angry troopers, we met Han and ended up in the worst part of the run yet. Another fucking box. In this room though, the box was not the issue. It's getting to where the box spawns. You can walk around the bottom of the room to get around to the track, or you can go up to this transition zone. When I heard the sound that this transition door gives you, I got super turned around, and thought I might have ended up back inside of the cantina. I thought it was all one room, unless I'm back in the cantina. Until I did end up back inside the cantina and realized the error of my ways. Take a guess at how long I got stuck in this one area, not the level, just this one single area. 
10 minutes, 15 minutes, how about uh, half an hour? Yeah, 30 minutes of walking back and forth through a transition barrier. Woo! If canopy is in the bottom... Oh, wait. Yep. So, let me explain that in my mind for you. Because that was the dumbest thing I've done all day. I guess in my mind, I thought that canopy put you to where you, where I just entered from. But I now am remembering that it is it is a little bit lower than that. And then over here, I gotta be careful. Because I gotta hit B to hit a lever. That's a wall. That's target side. This lever's this way. The rest of Spaceport goes as expected. I missed the skip for the fight, which wow, who would have guessed a blind man missed a semi-precise trick, and ended Spaceport at three and a half hours into the run, a one hour and 15 minute level. As far as it goes, level 4 really isn't that bad. There's an abundance of Stormtrooper panels to keep yourself in line, and as long as you're always mashing B and holding into the walls, you won't have any issue keeping the helmets on your head. Though level 5 is a much different story. While the trash compactor and hallway afterwards don't take too much time to beat, the turnstile room is a lot more open. I decided to do a small skip where you can jump off of the thin air right when your grapple ends. It took me a long time to find the lever that activates the target and a few misses of that trick, but eventually I was able to make it over, pull the lever, and open up the ramp to the car. Oh, yeah, I forgot about the car. Now I needed to find my way to the car, then use it to press 5 buttons in a straight line, then do the grapple trick again. Or do I? Instead, I figured it would be easier to drop in both players and multitask the buttons, since I figured I could easily line up both characters in a corner and backtrack until I hear the button sounds. And it worked. Maybe the first positive thing in the entire run. Ah, oh, I'm a genius. Crane room goes a lot better, as it's pretty much just a straight hallway with echolocation, but the elevator is much more akin to the grapple section in terms of its difficulty. Admittedly, I made this area a lot harder on myself, as once I finished it, I had to go forward to the pit room, then back to the bottom of the elevator. Why? Well, it's for a glitch where you can deload the stormtroopers in the final room. By heading back to the corner of the room near the hat dispenser, all of the troopers that normally rain down on the end of the level never end up spawning. And because the game thinks that you've then beaten all of them, it loads in the loading zone that ends the level, which makes it a lot easier than solving another five or so puzzles. Big thanks to Bixel and T-Fresh for helping me out with this one. Aside from that though, just landing on the elevator is hard enough, as it doesn't wait for you standing on it to move, it's constantly on a cycle. I got lucky with the cycles the first couple times around, but it only takes one miss to get yourself all turned around. After that, we're just one giant door and one leap of faith away from ending off 4-5. Oh! Oh! Let's go! <laughs> How long was that one? Uh, 50 minutes? Hey, that's not bad. It's on the shorter side. Which we then immediately return to in free play in order to grab invincibility. I felt pretty good ending the stream here for today, and gave myself another week to practice episode 2 before returning on the next Monday. We began day 2 by grinding out studs in 3-1, while also grabbing the vehicle smart bomb extra from that same level, and buying both that and invincibility at the cantina shop. Instead of then playing out the rest of episode 3, we went to clear episode 2, trying to get our hands on exploding bolts ASAP. I knew right away that Bounty Hunter Pursuit was not going to be a very fun level. While you can essentially just hold up in these long rooms to get through with ease, it was these dreaded torpedo sections that made this level a nightmare. To leave these square arenas, you have to torpedo these yellow things. I'm not really sure what they're supposed to be. In order to get the torpedoes though, you have to fly over these white lights. Once you find all of them, the torpedo station opens up. Here's the awful part. Neither the torpedo station opening up nor activating the lights makes any sound whatsoever. The only way we'll know if we did things correctly is if we shoot a torpedo by mashing B. I tried a couple of different methods to make these rooms work, like going up and down over and over to try and clear every ground inch, but because of the awkward camera angle these rooms are at, I was just retreading the same ground over and over. 
When I had realized that nothing was happening, I chose to just kind of coast around the room, like watching the DVD player icon just bounce around the screen. This worked really well in the first arena, and I left it around 7 minutes in, but Arena 2 took more than double that time. Eventually, though, we could leave Coruscant and fly over to Kamino, almost 7 hours in. This was a pretty influential level, as it opened my eyes to quite possibly the most important trick in the run altogether. The Lightsaber Counterpart to Echolocation, Saber Clipping. Much like how we can use the blaster sounds to center ourselves in rooms, we can also use the sounds that lightsabers make when they collide with walls to do the same. Lightsabers have two points of collision on them, about a quarter of the way from the top and the same on the bottom. When you walk into a wall with your saber out, you'll hear both of these points connect with the wall, making this vibration sound. While this is less efficient than echolocation, it also has its own benefits. Because of it colliding with only two points on the saber, we can even gauge the height of whatever is in front of us. If we only hear the saber vibrate once like on this box, we know that whatever's in front of us is not a wall, and we're able to jump over it. Or on the opposite side of that spectrum, we can jump in the air to see if the top part of the saber collides with a ceiling or a platform above us, which is super useful in Darth Maul. But I'm getting carried away. After getting lost in this very well-designed circular hallway, we can use the saber clips to align ourselves right below the button puzzle, spend a bit of time feeling out the size of it, and successfully make our way to Django. Okay, I gotta cut inward on the first one and outward on the second one. But next try. Hold on, don't watch that. That was not it. Yeah, you don't really move with a direct 45 anywhere, so it's kind of hard. Is that it? Woo! Ah, shit. Just too good at this game, man. It's just... Curtis Creates it's... says, Common Owens watching you being like, I'm glad we didn't clone whoever this guy is who can't <laughs> walk a simple square. <laughs> Not a great template, huh? You slash at the Kamen Owen. Dude, it's just, it's just too easy, you know? Like, give me a challenge. Come on. The rest of this level isn't too bad, as you can just kind of hold into the wall on the bridge section for a large majority of it, and just time your reflex well during the boss fight to leave for Geonosis 45 minutes later. Okay, so I'm left and top, so we'll just go this way, or right and top, Curtis sorry. Says he's just standing there, menacingly. Where? I can't see him. I've gone around the whole thing. Right again. It f***ed asshole. To him, he moved like two meters, and you fell off the edge. I got him. He's dead as hell. All right, uh, the Droid Factory's up next. Another half an hour. We're actually doing a lot better than uh, we were in the last stream. For those who are new to the channel, there's this weird running trend where every iteration of the Droid Factory level, whether it's in this game or the Skywalker Saga, causes some kind of issue with the challenge that we're playing. But I'm happy to say that the curse has finally been broken. Most, if not all, of Droid Factory is at this weird isometric 45-degree-ish angle. So all we have to do in the first couple of rooms is walk in the upright direction and overcorrect just a little bit to the right. Sure, the room where you first meet C-3PO is troublesome, since there's no sound cue for where he is besides him, uh, dying, but that's hardly an issue, making this normally hellish level take right around 30 minutes. Oh, look how far we've come. The same goes for Jedi Battle, which is always RNG-based regardless, and all that really needs to happen for us is for our jump slams to connect with the various waves of enemies, giving us yet another 30-minute level. But it's here where we meet one of the most important levels in the run, Gunship Cavalry. Not only is it home to the exploding blaster bolts red brick, but also the very first traditional vehicle level. I needed to not only navigate myself to where the red brick is, but also drag multiple exploding balls through fields of enemies, without losing them. Invincibility and Vehicle Smart Bomb make this task a lot easier, 
As I could use VSB to destroy the enemies, and invincibility made me immune to the lasers that populate the level. I knew the general area where the ball dispensers were, and all I had to do was find the best path back and forth. It's essentially just a straight line, so it wasn't all too bad. But first, the extra. It's located at the right edge of the map before the second gate. So I could easily hug the edge of the cliff to get there. But there was one thing I didn't account for. The red brick sound and the minikit sound are the exact same sound bite. And there just so happened to be a minikit right in front of the brick. I could have left this level 5 to 10 minutes earlier than I did, but I was so unsure of if I had actually grabbed the red brick or not that I chose to keep hugging the wall and waiting for the second sound bite, which never came, because I had already grabbed the red brick, like 15 minutes earlier. I think this picture that my Discord made sums up the level pretty well. The end of Gunship is more or less the same. When you hear a laser hit you, grab a bomb and run back there, simple as that. I even left the level with nine mini kits. What did I miss? Oh, we got the red brick too. Okay, cool. Uh, one level left of the stream. That one took us 45 minutes. It goes to show what over searching for one red brick will do for you. I'd like to say that Dooku posed any kind of challenge, but Anakin was honestly more detrimental to the run than Dooku ever could have been, as once I got the button puzzle done, he decided to push me off of the top platform and confused the absolute hell out of me. Oh? Short fall. <gasps> this is first try, it's just, it's just too easy. Is Anakin stuck down there now? Dude, can you just jump? Where are you? Jump up here. There we go. Idiot. I use his goddamn legs. I got a first try. He didn't even try. But that was all of episode two, an infinitely easier stream than the last, which made me pretty optimistic about the following stream, where we'd be tackling the rest of episode one. Where episode four took six hours, I had gotten done with episode two in three. The practice was paying off. Let's hope it stays that way. The Return to the Phantom Menace, one that I wasn't too scared of. For one, both Invasion of Naboo and Podrace seemed like walks in the park. Naboo was essentially a single direction in each room, and Podrace was just two laps of whatever you want thanks to invincibility, and lap three was just trial and error. I think we're, like, we're in the ending area now. We'll just hold forward and see how we do. I heard the crowd that time. Okay, so we're building a working strategy. And if you don't hear anything, you're good to go. You hold forward through the next section until you hear lasers. You hold forward again. And you hold forward through a bunch of boost panels. You hear two twos. You round a corner. Oh, that was really good. Wait a minute. We should have learned where the boost panels are in the last area. Okay, so we go to the right first. Left. Oh! Okay, go back to the right. There's more? He's done it! Pod race is over. It was what came before and after those that I had to be wary of. As far as escape goes, it wasn't too bad. With the abundance of grapple sections on the floor, you could just mash B through the first room, as long as you were in the right general area. Jump and aimlessly shoot through the next few, and when it came to the final room, forget to turn on your brain. Yeah, I don't know why I defaulted to trying to press the middle button myself when I could have just used the force on this tree stand and gotten it pressed way earlier. Overall, things seemed to be going fine. But, as we all know, those feelings are usually short-lived. This staircase, this thing, a lot of Star Wars fans think the first movie is named after Maul, but this, this really was the Phantom Menace of the run. Never in my life could I have thought a staircase could be so difficult. You might think, oh, BD1P, you can just go up and circle and jump around it. No, you'd think so. If not for the 30 different NPCs that think pushing you back to the ground level is the fastest way to get things done. I hate these other party members. I can't do anything when they're near me. 
After a while, we cleared enough of the partner players out of the way for us to properly use the single tap saber clips and make our way to the top, where we then fell off. Twice. Oh my god. Turns out this bridge that I thought was a perfect 45 degree angle was just a little bit off, which caused us to walk off the bridge and again, all the way back down. After a surprise visit from my cat, I made it across the gap by flying over as R2, as it seemed like the safer option. The final room of the level is pretty easy, as spamming jump shots with EBB tends to kill the droids eventually. This leaves only one more level in the movie, since we tackled negotiations way back in Stream 1, and it just so happens to be the hardest one. Darth Maul. While the first room is decided by reaction time, room 2 is decided mostly by brute force. I had a guide that I was practicing from before the run began, but it wasn't going to do me any good if I lost where I was. There were only two checkpoints I could use to definitively pinpoint my position, and it was these two forcible platforms. If I hit the B button and they extended, I had to be either on the platform to the left or right below. So we break it down into a game of getting to the platforms, and then jumping right after. To begin, we can make it onto the first platform by heading over to the right corner and spamming jump. Once our jumps stop being stunted, we can move into the back corner while in mid-air, raising us up one level. After a brief walk forward, we're able to go up once again. We can use the same jump technique or the sound from the saber clipping above us to go up another layer, and then fall off. Again... Again, again, and ag oh, we made it over this time. Using the stud sounds to know we found a new area, we can do another platform jump to- <sighs> Whoa, would you look at that, my editing software glitched. Uh, don't look at that timer down there, we totally did not fall off three more times after that. Nope, first try. We slash at some droids in the next room before we encounter another area that turns us backwards, upside down, and reversed. The Droidica Platforms. Pressing the button is easy enough, but we then need to make two 45 degree jumps and another straight jump at an axis that pushes you off the edge if you're only holding forward and nothing else. I was stuck here for so long that I ended up forgetting which side of the platform I was on and jumped to this little plasma beam section over here, and was only able to realize that I was in a completely random area because of the studs on the ground. If these weren't here, I would have been stuck for a good extra 20 minutes. Let's just go for it. I'm getting studs. I seem to be in a wall. I hear the hum. I think I'm like in... I don't know where I am anymore. But rest assured, we made it out. And during the mall fight, actually landed a pretty cool trick by attacking him on the same frame as both characters. With the newfound confidence of what was most likely just a placebo effect, we were able to close out episode 1 with another 3-4 to four hour segment. And with this same confidence, I went into episode 3 pretty cocky. Way too cocky, actually. Uh, we only had 5 levels to beat this stream, as we had done level 1 earlier on. With one of those levels being the very short fight against Grievous, I was still riding high. Until the second level shot me down. Room 1 and 2 are easy enough. Some simple angles to follow and a couple of platforms to force. 3 is the same deal as panel radius location gets you to R2 with ease. And then, this room. One that caused quite a few issues in the no-jump run, and was equally as troublesome here. Once I had taken out the droids, I lost my sense of direction. I knew what I needed to do, but not where to do it. I got the great platform forced down, but it caused way more issues than it solved, as it meant I wasn't able to hug the wall to jump up here anymore. I would have to move back a little bit and then go up. For whatever reason though, I just couldn't get my distance right, and usually I would way overshoot and walk into the far right corner. After a while, I noticed that whenever I crossed a certain threshold, player 2 would jump, which had to be them going up to the higher layer. I felt around for a bit and sure enough I was up one layer. I hated that. It's so like weird. I mean, okay, so here's the thing, is like, Bruce Tim is a very horny man. After jumping up once again, Player 2 soon followed, which was a really good way to guide myself. A couple of fails and one force of the elevator later, and we are up. Yes? Oh my god, freedom. It's left, right?
I love droidicas. In the fight against Dooku, I had really only anticipated one part of the fight being hard when you're being shocked and you have to switch over to player 2. I circumvented this by swapping between player 1 and 2 very frequently, so I could keep both of them pretty close together for another switch, and then be able to slash target Dooku when needed. That was only the anticipated difficulty though, as the real fun of the challenge lies in the unanticipated, like another staircase. The staircases in this room in specific are at a very awkward angle, but to make it even worse, the camera angle changes the second you make it onto one of the staircases, which makes lining yourself up for the second phase of Dooku, or even the door to leave the room, very frustrating. This must be the hardest stairs in the world to climb if I cannot find this shit. Chris Uba says, I never realized just how many camera angles could be in a single room until I watched this. That's kind of the issue I'm running into, is like, man, they change angles a lot in this game. I don't trust myself that I've made it up yet. Wall. No wall. What the fuck? If down bringing me back down. Ah! What the. What? Huh? After enough time spent walking into force fields, we made it up and PRL'd our way into the next room, which is just an excuse to hold the left button down for a bit. The gas room was fine, just requiring some character switches and even more PRL, and the final room is more or less the exact same. Ending off the level already 70 minutes into stream. This one level had taken over a third of the time as the last two streams did. And I was hoping that the Grievous level would help balance that out. And it did. Kind of. Based off of my practice, this level shouldn't have taken me any more than 5 minutes. There's a neat little trick you can do to uh, take out Grievous early, called Grieve Cheese. It has you jumping back and forth from this ledge as Commander Cody, and repeatedly shooting back at him, which skips him jumping around the map and takes out the boss in seconds. I had found a consistent setup to jump to the rock as it's just walking down from your starting position, but for some reason, after getting him below half of his health, he jumped away to the cliffside, and regained a lot of the health that I had already taken away. I'm too far over. What happened? I couldn't move. Yeah, whatever. He's still fine. Why did... Oh my god. He put his fucking saber away, dude. Yeah, he's not here anymore. Yeah. Fuck, how did... Did I shoot him when he was too close to me? What happened? So much for Grievous not taking that long. This was bad, as I didn't do any routing for if I had messed up the Grieve Cheese, and now I had to rely only on my awful memory of this level, that I hadn't played casually in forever. Which made this less than 5 minute level take over 20 minutes. I don't- I'm- I don't hear him, okay. Uh... Gravel? Let's go really far back. Oh my god, that worked. This is not fun. Oh, okay, wait, I fell off. Well, I, I know where I am, though, now. Ah! Oh my god, finally, dude. This was shaping up to be quite the stream. There isn't much to say about Kashyyyk, as while it took around 30 minutes, there's really nowhere to get lost besides the droid room, which only caused me a little bit of grief. And Jedi Ruin was all fine and good up until the door to the library. Here I had two options. I could complete the room casually, doing a bit of platforming, forcing, lever pulling, and whatever else, or I could do a drop and warp. DIWs or drop and warps are done by manipulating the camera and player 1's position to drop in player 2 in areas they aren't supposed to be. By standing at the very top corner of the door, putting the camera in the top right of the screen, and dropping in player 2 at the apex of your jump, they'll spawn behind the door and be able to walk right in. 
I chose to do the DIW, as the platforming was really difficult to do blind, and there was also a really easy setup and sound cue to know if you're in the right place for the warp. You can use saber clipping to line yourself up in the middle of the hallway, jump forward, and once you're all the way against the wall, begin the warp. So I started to try doing the warp at 14 hours and 6 minutes into the run. I finally got the warp at 14 hours and 25 minutes into the run. OH MY GOD! Maybe this wasn't faster, uh, after all. The big issue I ran into was just getting onto the door, as the sound for clipping into the bottom of the arm and the top of the door frame were pretty similar, but obviously eventually I did get it done. Either way, the level was over, and while it could have gone better, there were some more pressing things to worry about. Darth Vader. This is a level that looks impressively hard to do, with multiple challenging platforming sections that kill you for being off by just a few pixels, but I had a trick up my sleeve. This level, as intimidating as it looks, is incredibly easy, because nearly every moment in the level can be done by moving at any of the 45 degree angles. Take the first room for example, where all it is is just holding down. The first three jumps are equally spaced, and then all you have to do is just a couple of bigger, tighter timed jumps to make it through. Wait, I heard a timer. We're in the right room! Okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. Go, go, just walk forward, walk forward, walk forward. Room 2 is almost just as simple, where all you need to do is walk up and right and mash the B button. I got stuck though getting to the door and left the room with mere milliseconds to spare. Just take a look. I lived! Well, well, well. Well, well, well. After some more light puzzle solving, we hit the really flashy part of the run and I absolutely popped off. No, we got the angles down, though. I played it last night, I played it before stream. I played it on stream before this. I just don't know the very end. Up. Right and up. And I think it's just straight up. Wait! <gasps> okay, I gotta be careful. I, I... Shoot, what do I do? It falls. Wait! Holy shit, this is the fastest Darth Vader I've ever done. Again, looks complicated, right? Well, as I said earlier, every jump here is at a 45 degree angle, with a few minor corrections. Up left, up left, up right, right, up, up, and you're good. This made episode 3 yet another 3 hour episode, despite level 1 taking up 70 minutes. And with only two movies to go, it became apparent to me that this very well could be a sub one day run, which I honestly didn't expect. But the episodes we had left over, 6 and 5, were the two longest in the game, and were home to a majority of the more difficult levels. So I ended the stream for that day, somewhat dreading the things to come. Episode 6, my least favorite episode in the game. The levels are long, the tricks are hard, and most of all, the red brick is vital. I won't bore you with the details of Jabba's palace, as although it took a long time, you can echo locate your way to each helmet dispenser and PRL to the bounty hunter panels. There are two issues with this though, as echo location becomes impossible with exploding blaster bolts turned on, since it always knocks your helmet off even if you do have invincibility turned on. And the same goes for throwing a thermal bomb, which just so happens to be the same button you use to activate panels. This meant that I needed to be on the money when it came to activating the panels, and know my way around to find the hats. Aside from that, there was the droid room, which is just simply using the button sounds to guide the platform to each respective droid. Apparently I ended up jumping on top of 3PO's cage and just not falling down, which would have saved me a lot of time. Glad to see that things haven't changed. After a long box room and a Rancor fight, we're onto Carcoon, which is once again pretty standard as far as the run goes on the outside. When we get inside, though, things take a turn for the worse, notably in the Disco Room. 
If you remember how much grief 2-1 cost us, imagine that, but with more buttons and random patterns. Welcome to Disco. You have to stand on the lit up button, and once your partner player finds the other, move on to the next. The button order is completely random, and if you take even a second too long, the puzzle resets. I almost had my Twitch chat tell me where to move, but decided to tough it out, and thus began the Disco Grind. Is it done? I heard movement. In my naivete, I thought this was the hardest thing I'd be doing all stream. Having practiced episode 6 quite a few times, I was once again overly confident. But there are always angles you cannot prepare for. Speeder Showdown By all accounts, this should have been the easiest level in the movie. It's quite literally just holding forward and solving very simple puzzles and then fighting another very linear boss. I started out just running and gunning the speeder troopers and got all the way to the end of the level with zero issues. The only thing I needed to do was build the final walker and shoot the radio tower. That's it. That is all I had to do. I had no idea what just one misstep would do to me. Okay. You should be over here to the left then. In a wall? This way? Those are speeders. I could have swore it was left. Am I stupid? Oh no. Dude! I'm gonna lose it. I was stuck. No amount of walking, shooting, or dying could get me out of this ravine. We tried reloading the room and even attempted the speeder skip, but you aren't able to do it in this state for whatever reason. It was over. I would have to redo this already 45 minute level. Well, there was one other thing we could try. I noticed that when I drove a speeder into the gap with the walker inside of it, the walker would stop making a stomping noise, and the speeder wouldn't immediately die, which meant there was a chance I could launch the walker out of the pit by ramming into it with a speeder. This wouldn't be easy though, as I would have to be piloting the walker with one player and maneuvering the speeder with another, and I wouldn't be able to tell if I was free until I actually hit the radio tower but it was my only choice. So once again, we got to work. Attempt after attempt, failure after failure, nothing was working. I had even tried using both players on speeders at one point to try and pincer maneuver it out, but again, nothing. Was that it? Did I have to reset the entire level? Is my speeder, dude. Pouting Frog says, Yes. Am Game I out? Says, it's out. Oh my god. Somehow it 
worked. We freed ourselves, took down the boss, and were one level closer to finishing the entire game. The end of the run was close in sight. The clock was ticking as I headed into the Battle of Endor, which despite one minor issue with Wicket being stuck earlier in the level, went pretty alright. I skipped over the whole platforming bunker section by doing a camera pan that teleports Leia and Chewie on top, and didn't run into any issues when actually inside of that bunker. And Palpatine 2 had some minor issues, mostly revolving around the catwalk and the fan, but because of how short the level is, and the fact that we had invincibility, it felt like nothing could hold us down. And so we get to now enter into arguably the most important level of the run, 6-6. This level is home to the Infinite Torpedoes Red Brick, and was the only possible way we'd be able to get through both Force 6 and Falcon Flight. The first room is something we've already seen quite a few times before, just large circles until we destroy all of these starfighters, and to be honest, when we actually enter the Death Star, things stay roughly as easy. It only takes a couple of directional turns to reach both the torpedo station and blowing up the wall, with us having to double back only once for a second grouping of torpedoes. In the following hallway, it does take some time to align into the torpedo station, sent it's tucked all the way in the back corner with a little gap that's pretty easy to get stuck inside of. But rest assured, we were able to make it out and open up the next door. Before going in though, we have to go back one more time for a few more torpedoes to access the red brick in the core. And after hugging the wall to get there, we blow up the Death Star, spam fire, and hold down. And complete all of Episode 6. This episode felt more like 90% filler and 10% pain, with the filler taking ages and the pain being absolute hell. I'm gonna lose it. <sighs> it's why this movie clocked in at around 5 hours to complete, putting us further and further away from landing the sub one day we fought so hard for. We only had 7 levels left, into the Death Star and all of Episode 5. This was the culmination of everything we've worked for. The episode had a little bit of everything. A vehicle level with towing, a vehicle level with torpedoes, a puzzle level, and a level long boss fight. Every bit of this final stream was a hodgepodge of strategies we've already done and practiced. Sure, there were some episode specific things we had to learn, such as how in the hell we were going to do anything on Dagobah, the best strategies for fighting Vader and Bespin, and of course, all of CCT. With only 5 hours remaining on the timer, we took our time doing some pre-run setup in Dagobah. I wasn't too concerned with anything in the level until Luke's training. This was a section where you could be constantly harassed by enemies, had multiple sections of tricky platforming, and almost no way to guide yourself around. Slash targeting worked fine in the first island, and lucky for us again, as long as we could find our way to the buttons, those were all at 45 degree angles. It was the mushrooms that really bottlenecked this room. What I'm gonna say may sound a little crazy, but doing the mushrooms normally was borderline impossible. There was no sound cue for when they rise up, and the walking sound for the ground and the mushroom were the same, so I would never be able to tell if I was on one of the mushrooms or not. The only other option we had was Mushroom Skip. A difficult, very difficult and precise hover as R2 that uses the walls as ramps to raise you up into the air. This trick looks difficult, but I found a really consistent setup for the first hover. And if I ended up missing the second, there was a sound cue for me falling. Even if the jump itself was technically harder, the guides that I had were easier to follow. As uneasy as I was, I knew it would be almost required to go for this. Aside from Dagobah, the only other thing that concerned me was Bespin. Sure, the latter half of the level is fairly linear, but rooms like this one would prove to be problematic. Instead of just speaking through it for the hundredth time, I think it's better if I just show you.
I don't know, man. We have like two and a half hours. We still have Dago Bao, which is going to be a nightmare. The issue is there's no lineup for this. Skip has like a lineup. So we're doing skip. Fuck all of you. I'm doing skip. Chat, where am I right now? Am I on second mushroom? Iman48091 says, one minute left. I Yes! Believers, doubters, and shambles. It's the salt video title screen. Guys, we could do sub one day, holy shit. We have to play the best best bit of our lives, but we could do it. Oh, there we go. Come on, it's the final level. Too far, too far. Hug the Millennium Falcon, you dolt. Where's the door? Open the door. Oh god. Ever gonna find this? It's over! 2339! That's sub one day! It was over. Just 20 minutes shy of 24 hours, and we beat the complete saga blindfolded. 
This was far from the hardest thing I've done in my three years on YouTube, but is on the border of being the most time consuming. What took more time? Well, you're gonna have to wait around another month or so for that. If you made it this far through, it would mean a lot if you stopped by the streams every once in a while, as we do challenges like this all the time, some that don't even make it over to YouTube, as well as a few other events like the Community Minecraft server, where I just got done rebuilding all of Wayne Manor from LEGO Batman 1. Thank you so much for joining me on this crazy journey, and I'll be back next week. Hopefully.